Hello and most welcome to age 794. 84, sorry. 93. <laughs> a bit of a confusion here. Uh, I, I'd say that uh, something happened here. I'm going back to Julian Barber and uh, my idea today is to explain uh, the time capsule. Some aspects of it has eluded me before, so I will get back to that today and see if I can make some sort of comprehensive uh, explanation for the time capsule. Uh, I call the lecture Many Nows. And first, a little recap. It was three years ago I took time capsule. And you should think about somebody digging into the ground and putting a metal box with all memories in this metal box. These things has happened many times and they usually refer to as time capsules. Uh, no water can come in and it's firmly closed and locked and they leave a map where it is and there it's left for about a hundred years. Once you open the time capsule again you get a view into how the world was a hundred years ago. All the information you have about this instant in that time is coming from the time capsule. All the connections all of reality, so to speak. Let's see, I find a time capsule from uh, 1922 and everything that's in the time capsule, that's all there is. I don't have anything else, especially maybe it's from an isolated place I know little about. But it could be connections between the things in the time capsule and it makes up a whole world in itself. This is what Julian Barber means by many nows. Some singular things come from the diamond of all moments in the world. They are already there, so to speak. But remember, there is no time in his project so it doesn't really make to sense uh, make sense to say they're already there. One aspect because of prana come pinpointed and you can see that in his description it's a light that's lit in the diamond and that becomes a moment. Within this moment, it could be this moment, it's also the past stored just like the time capsule. So in this very instant, so to speak, my memories are stored in the time capsule. So that they do not depend on a timeline of a past in this sense, uh, in the Newtonian sense. And all the relation between my memories and, for instance, Callum memories or Henrik's memories or whoever, whoever is looking now, uh, the reason for similarities to be is because we might be sharing time capsule in some ways. There are similarities. And this is a, what I call shape space. But in some aspect, this is completely unique for my moment. So everything about future, everything about past, it's all stored in the time capsule. And then somebody would say, why? Future seem much more dimmer than the past. Well, you could see the future as more of a potentiality, a seed or something like that. It does not have to spring into a uh, existence in the future and also it's not that clear whereas the past is clearer and that's an effect how past is different from future but that doesn't mean that we are going on the timeline which is the usual model to perceiving this 
Both models are okay for daily communication, but they are very different in the foundation. So it doesn't really matter which model you have if you're going to go shopping, buy some stamps, or send a letter to someone else that will arrive three days later. It doesn't matter. It still works. But if you go down to the grit, to the real physics, to the foundation, this makes a whole lot of difference. It actually changed uh, the very foundation, the pillars. You could call this a 4D entity or a multi-dimensional entity. And this is, of course, my movement we could call a three-dimensional entity because I have in this very moment, I have width, I have breadth, I have depth. Uh, so it's coming, it's projected, you could say, actually, from four dimension. But what makes it spring into action is this extra thing. It's the prana, it's the intention. Because it is actually, in quantum mechanics, an aspect of intention. That's the observer and this is why it's so incredibly hard to explain the observer but here it doesn't need much explaining because you can at least picture it and that's a good start now you know that there is an extra thing it's called prana key or as uh, barber call it lightning uh, direction could it also be called there is a direction and everything is going somewhere and the going somewhere is the alignment alignment of shapes there are similar and this actually solves some of the problems that Einstein never could come to grip with because he was halfway into quantum mechanics but at the same time he had one leg still standing in Newtonian physics and that uh, made some problems in his theory one of those we mentioned before it's black hole black holes are paradox for Einstein. It doesn't solve itself within the Einsteinian paradigm. So what is important is in some aspect this is not within a bigger coordinate system. It, it's not part of something that is universal or global. It is by itself and it's complete. It doesn't lack anything. And this, of course, sounds really odd. You can imagine these models are, in a way, when you start fantasizing about them, so incredibly different. And they show different things about reality. But just to think that the moment is complete in itself is sort of scary. Uh, I, I, I got uh, what we call in... A Swedish svindel. Uh, what is that in English now? I forgot. Uh, that's what you look. You are vertigo. Standing. Vertigo. It gives you sort of a vertigo. I'm standing here and I'm looking down into my own time capsule. And I think that vertigo effect is going to... Uh, it's going to disappear slowly. I think it's going to... You get used to this. I think it could be a comfort to know that this is actually how time is perceived in the East. It's exactly this way. And this is what they mean or we mean when we describe, for instance, the time in Veda or the time in Tao to be circular. Uh, that description never gave me anything. It's just something that I heard, I've been repeating myself but I never got it. What on earth is this circular? Sounds good. It sounds really nice with a circle moving about, but it doesn't really explain anything. Now, finally, I come to an understanding. 
what is the time capsule is a much better idea. And this also goes for the metaphor of the idea that uh, every new day is a new world. Uh, it's a something from Veda. Uh, this is more like it. This is something that is separate from the whole of existence, but it contains the whole of existence. And you have to think some of the traces or some of the parts here are very hard to reach, but they are potentially reachable in some way. Indirectly, maybe they leave this famous Deridian trace somewhere. Maybe you just have some sort of feeling, but that means you actually have access to the whole of existence. This solves this problem with the timeline. We don't need this timeline anymore. And one of the reasons it's so nice to get rid of it, it leads to so many paradoxes. It doesn't work nice. It doesn't work in physics and it actually gives even us common people, laymen, a lot of paradoxes. We get stranded in different things like uh, Zeno's paradox or uh, we end up somewhere close to Parmenides. We don't understand how time could be reversible. Well, it cannot. Time can't be reversible. It's, it's just uh, it becomes nonsense somewhere. One other way of showing the whole thing is you can imagine a big book and on each page there is a moment and this process is taking the envelope away and reading all the pages and they flow out on the ground and every page is a now. Some happening is going on on that page and they will align uh, because of similarity in the end. And this is actually fun because the page I took up here is a genuine time capsule. Here we see the former king actually. So you can imagine when I see him, I can imagine me being the other person, not like, not like I want to be a little girl, but if I am the other person, I will have memories of the old king. And maybe if I'm a very smart person, I will know he's, he was an archaeologist and he was a specialist in Etruscan uh, history and all that. Very interesting person in itself. So this is a rather good metaphor for what is time in Julian Barber. And this is also a very good start to get into quantum time or the quantum conception of reality. They are time capsule instances and now it also makes more sense with Schrodinger's cat because you'll have memories of the cat but you don't have to have this existence thing existence seems to be something that is the same over time and I think that's the very feeling or uh, could be a definition of existence. It is actually a definition in Newton, but in general sense, that's the feeling that you have a continuity, continuity over time here. And this is the same here, this is the same here, and this is the same here. You can see how sameness over time is not so much a construction of reality as the idea coming from the linear time model. That's why we need this existence. We think, but we don't need it. One other most interesting problem with Einstein's special theory is that there is no way at all to say that anything happens simultaneously. That's impossible in, in Einstein. And you see here, when he tried to solve some really unsurmountable problems, he created new ones. And the good thing with quantum mechanics, it doesn't 
have to do that problematic thing of explaining simultaneity. It's already in here. If you want to have simultaneity, every little trace of every other person on earth is contained within that. There is nothing outside. Everything is inside every moment. And then it's you almost by your observing capacities that says that two things are simultaneously based on material that can be said to be independent of you. You have to see the things here, not as things as you can affect. And that is another idea that is very problematic. You see here, this is piling up problems. And this is the idea of the subject. It's almost like an object. It's also the same all the time. And this is usually in Newtonic theory called something like a subjective experience. And you got loads of problems when you have this idea of the subjective experience. Where is it situated, for instance? And you, you, you start with these mad conclusions. There is no such thing as subjective experience. It doesn't make sense. And, uh, and what you get in the end is like a huge catastrophe. It becomes a jumble. And somebody who's probably Daniel Dennett, he raises his hand and says, I, I solved the problem. Yeah, he solved half the problem. And his solution is to ignore the other part of the problem, which is once again prioritizing, dividing, prioritizing and marginalization. And what does he marginalize? Well, he marginalizes existence or presencing, what we perceive. He says that that's not really very important, what we perceive. So he is going on the opposite direction of quantum mechanics, something that flies in the face of physics. Uh, this has been actually pointed out to him in a very complicated manner. Uh, by uh, Alvin Plantinga, and that's one of the reasons we've seen this recent change, especially among uh, these really weird gang called the epistemologists. They're all Christian now. I don't care what they are. I don't think they should be working with the thing they are working with. But it's still interesting uh, how people solve one problem by making another problem much bigger. Uh, that's a halfway solution. We need to make everything conform to the, the, the wheeler de Witt equation. That's really important. In the words of uh, Carlo Rovelli, one finds that time disappears from the Wheeler de Witt equation. It's not there. Uh, it's an issue that many theorists have puzzled about. It may be that the best way to think about quantum reality is to give up the notion of time, that the fundamental description of the universe must be timeless. When I mention time, it's the linear time. And isn't it interesting how, how our language happened to have this idea of linearity and succession of moments and this idea of succession of moments created both object and a subject that sees the object. Once more we have this marvelous story told by for instance Ian McKilchrist and Jane James James Jaynes, about how once upon a time we did not differentiate between subject and object. Everything was in the verb. And now I think I hinted really clearly at the verbal activity. Think about this motion as a verb motion, a sort of action. A sort of action that doesn't have to be transitive or intransitive, it doesn't have to take an object, and neither does it have to take no object, just like the verbs you find in, for instance, Hopi language. 
Some people, uh, for instance, my old professor said that the object I can see here, the object is actually something uh, baked into the verb in the Hopi language. And this is clinging to the old model where you want to see an object and there is always a possibility to add something ad hoc, divide, marginalize, and you can do the process once more. And then you can have your subject and your object. You can say, well, the Hopi Indians always already have ob objects and subjects. They perceive themselves to be subjects. Uh, and that's one of the uh, sad things we didn't uh, have the opportunity to talk to uh, this uh, Indian friend of us, uh, Tio Kassin. It'd be nice to hear directly for somebody who actually speaks a language who doesn't use object, who doesn't use subject, who's not dependent on this difference between intransitive and transitive verbs, but just use this action form. And it must be a rather different feel to the whole language. But I'm also thinking the Indians are different in other ways. Their sense of direction is uncanny. They are master at balance. Uh, I don't know if uh, the listeners today know who constructed, for instance, Empire State Building. Uh, the uh, World Trade Center, who was standing on these ledgers without any form of security. Those were actually Indians. Majority of the construction workers, if you go beyond the 17th, 7th, 17th floor, were Indians. And the reason were they had an excellent balance. They never wavered. They could stand on the ledges, carrying things, doing welding. I, I can't even imagine doing welding on that height. It's scary. Once you get some sort of a, a reaction, you can even get a, a bit of an explosion. I would fall off directly. But these people were completely unwavering. And this is this upward direction because the prana roll, uh, runs through the body going from the bottom and upwards. And I think it's very interesting. The upward sense is similar to this creative sense that we find in quantum mechanics for each moment. Something that usually in Swedish or English is called an energy or a force, but it has nothing to do with force or energy at all, really. And that's actually quite confusing to say that. It's rather something we don't name in the West, and it's the actual process from each moment to a line in the procession of shapes that are similar. This that Julian Barber often showed with triangles that were similar, maybe differed a little bit, and they constitute a succession that is time. But remember, on this succession, there is no outside measure for time. There is no washing line. Another explanation that Julian Barber gave that became much clearer to me uh, just two hours ago. So this is like news. The washing line is Newtonian physics. And in the Newtonian physics, you need two things. You need the moments and you need this extra washing line. That's the linear time. So you can show the succession of moments. It's like a clock, an absolute clock, absolute time. And this, of course, is a supplement, something extra that Newton put in to explain something that, for instance, uh, Huygens really disliked. Why put something into something that already works? 
Why add something? And he would know he was the constructor of the modern clock. He would know there is no washing line inside a clock. It's not necessary. But I think this supplement has become a necessity in the end. And in the end, it shows of an original lack in our perception of reality. And that original lack also goes for a lowering of the prana, of the ki. And you could say that the effect of embodying Newtonian physics or Newtonian general ideas is a lack of prana, lack of direction. And when we mention classical physics, it's this lack of direction, lack of stamina, lack of balance. There is something there, we can feel it, but we made it ourselves, it's not a necessity. We can actually regain this prana. There are very good methods to regaining that energy and you can feel the light coming back to your body. And what I feel is like going back to my childhood because I remember everything to be brighter. And this brightness that this gives, it has a special feel to it. And uh, it's not a heating light, it's maybe the light of creativity as well. Everything is possible. And that feeling I remember from childhood, and this exactly what you find within the diamond. All the possibilities are there. And this is not something that Julian Barber or quantum mechanic hypothesize. This is how it works. It must work like that. There's no other possibility. We elect the moments ourselves. The just that we lost our power. Why would that be? Well, all the passive tendencies we have in our language that the Hopi Indian doesn't have. The passive tendency to have an object and a subject. That's already something that diminished the energy that is going on in the system. Sorry for using the word energy. You see how hard it is to convey. But the lack of direction makes classical physics feel true. It feels like everything is determined. It doesn't feel like I have a soul, like a prana or a will. It doesn't feel like there is a purpose in my body, in my reality. This is not a conviction. It's a bit more than that. It's an actual experience of lack of prana. And therefore, it's in a way meaningless to argue. I wouldn't say that to 100%. Arguing and putting arguments could be a very good start. But look at those epistemologists. They shouldn't do that. They should do something sensible with their lives, not studying how we know. Because that is once more this tendency of looking at the timeline, going back a while and ask yourself, how did Ulle know that the cow was on the field? And similar nonsensical things. <laughs> I'm deeply traumatized by my five points in epistemology. Now, there are much better explanations for how reality sort of uh, come to existence. Think of it as a big book. The book is getting thrown, the cover gets loose, and they sort of order themselves by similarity. And this similarity tendency is something that is dependent of our intention, because that's built in here. And this also explains why do we use this rather cumbersome term, there is an alternative to quantum theory, and that is quantum mechanics. And this is very interesting, I like these things, this is a, a little, bit, but, uh, little bit like history or etymology, and it's so reason, 
recent so we can still look into it why is it called quantum mechanics actually in a way when you went from classical physics this is a line it moves you have time it goes somewhere this is a bit more from one perspective more automatic it's more like a machinery that pops out these time capsules and this is the actual reason why it's called quantum mechanic it's a mechanical device but it's not mechanical in that sense it's determined that's odd it's not determinism in quantum mechanics it's a sort of a metaphor and in reality quantum mechanics is very far from being mechanical it's a very living thing everything comes out of the invisible and actually it's happening exactly in the same way living organisms come to existence how we move about this of course is connected to the wave principle uh, all particles of matter and all energy can be described also as waves in quantum mechanics and waves has as i mentioned before an unusual property uh, an infinite number of them can exist in the same location you can have infinity here and this is exactly what we have and this is also an aspect i mentioned about fractality it's the same thing fractality is the wave in action this is the macroscopic way of looking at the wave and how much information can it contain infinite whereas the old idea of my brain being a storage room uh, like a box that records everything that's outside in, whereas I move on the timeline that is finite of course and therefore it will not be able to store everything that happens in my life and that's another paradox and of course it cannot store the time capture so you that also helped for the understanding in the way an infinite amount of information can be stored you see the storage capacity is there and that also connects to the movement the direction is the movement and as we explained before this is to do with the spine the spine is the primal mover and therefore everything you think and do comes into action in either a better way or a lower way and that's all down to degree there's no absolute here this can be better you can make your prana much better you could be like a hoppy indian and not waver they seldom suffer back problems uh, they have just recently starting to get repetitive strain injuries and those things they are although uh, they live unhealthy life when it comes to food and drinks especially drinks they are very healthy which surprises people and it has to do with the key tendency the prana the chi because in quantum mechanics this is something to take into consideration is an important thing it will affect everything in our life it will make us be more creative because there is a creative aspect in this we can create our own reality and once we let go of this model it doesn't sound so weird anymore it, the vertigo is disappearing and all of a sudden you understand but you were in command your wishes do make some sense and once that week passed i would say take a week or two 
you will see it actually feels much more stable and real to understand that your wishing is something that is part of reality. It's not something that the subject make, made up. And you see here, as long as you think as wishing and willing is part of this construction, the subject on the timeline, it becomes directly divided. You have the object, you have the subject, you prioritize, in this case, the object, and you say that the subject is of a lower value. How can I say that? Well, for one reason, we say today, mostly, look up at any medical book or any uh, bio biology book until recently, it says that the object is making up the subject. How is that? Well, we are made of objects, atoms, molecules, and those things are separate, separatable and not part of the subjective experience. Mm. And this is the reason uh, for, uh, I would say, this is something that flies in the eyes of this poor chap, uh, Christopher Hitchin. Uh, I was checking out a video last uh, day and uh, he has a very strong argument there and uh, I, it, I looked at comments all over YouTube and also uh, uh, googled it. Are there anybody who said no to Christopher Hitchens? What he says is he using the good old Freudian argument. What he says is that obviously God cannot exist because we human beings we want to have God, and therefore we make him up. Something that comes actually from this model, where subject is something of lower degree. First is the division, and second is the prioritizing of the object. Christopher Hitchin thinks the objects are more real. Science, as he perceived science to be, was a science that was handling objects, atoms, molecules. We know better. Quantum mechanics does not think that the outermost reality of reality is particles. It's particles and waves. It makes a whole lot of a difference. And it's definitely not made of atoms. It doesn't have this disjunct view of the world. And therefore, all of a sudden, our wishes are objective. Now, not whole by and subject. There you are, objective slash subjective. Something that is part of the presence of reality. So you can no longer claim that's a reason for them to be made up. It doesn't matter if they're made up in some sense, because they are out there, obviously, and they are part of reality as well. So what he's trying to say, that's not really part of reality. The wishes. Um, there's something lower, of a lower degree. And I would say that the poor old chap, by heart, felt this was a horrible decision. Because he never looks happy. He doesn't. He looks really, really tortured. Every picture I saw. And the reason, of course, is that he's denies what he himself was saying. He doesn't deny it in the sense he doesn't believe it. He denies it in the sense that it hurts to believe that. And I still, I think it was an honest conviction he had, but he didn't like it somewhere in his soul. Uh, otherwise he would be smiling a little bit more than he did. He wouldn't be so aggressive and uh, he wouldn't said uh, I think the journalist asked him, did you ever have a happy moment or you, you felt you were in the flow? Well, I had one week and that was the week when uh, it began the Monday, uh, Princess Diana died in a crash in Paris and I couldn't believe my luck when Mother Teresa died the same week. Why do you say those things? 
The journalists thought it was funny, and also other people think it's funny. Well, maybe it's funny at a distance, but you, if you are that person, or you're so bitter within to say those things, hurtful things to yourself, it's uh, caused by this model. This is why quantum mechanics solves the whole thing. And uh, I wish I were there to tell Christopher Hitchens, well, I realized just this morning to the clearest of what's it all about. Uh, I think that's <laughs> quite a lot. It, it's siesta in most of uh, uh, the Mediterranean, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and France. So we should not have had lecture now, but I'm glad we did. And I say thank you very much. And until next time, have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye. Excellent.